Army Reserve and the National Guard will really be one of our key connectivity points to the nation. I'd like to switch gears just a little bit and talk more directly about our thoughts of the future and the role of the Army Reserve in enabling prevent, shape, and win in the future. Really kind of this is the uh, fundamental question, I think, is how do you define the operational reserve moving forward? How much operational reserve do you need? How much operational reserve can you afford? And here before, you know, the conversation when we talk about the operational reserve is really focused around usage. It's how much are we going to use? How much are we going to bring on active duty? Now, I would submit to you that that's one measure, but that's not the only measure. And if we continue to focus simply on usage moving forward, we're going to miss uh, we're, we're going to miss the point. We think there are really three elements in a macro sense to maintaining an operational reserve. But for today, we'll call them plan, train, and execute. Uh, by plan, we mean uh, primarily uh, planning and planning elements and a comprehensive uh, regional alignment strategy. The um, we have regional alignment now. Uh, but I would submit to you, at least in the Army Reserve, it's uh, a little too entrepreneurial and a little too fragmented. And so General Talley is developing a construct that will, uh, and a framework that will increase the coordination and allow us to get uh, expanded, better, and more focused support. And that regional alignment construct really has two key elements to it. One is, of course, regionally aligned units. This will be regionally aligned units in some fields down as low as the battalion level. And our current structure really allows us to do this and do this pretty effectively. Six or seven years ago, the Army Reserve was organized geographically. So there was, a, say, a commander in charge of all the units, regardless of whatever unit they were, in Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, and Florida. Uh, again, about six years ago, we made a construct change. So now we have all of the units that uh, are of a particular function that report up through the same uh, command and control uh, lines. And so all the signal units, all the engineer units, all the intelligence units, et cetera, roll up under uh, a commander from that uh, function, function. So why does that matter? Well, from a regional alignment perspective, it matters in the following way. It really allows us to understand very well our true capacity and our capability within each one of those uh, each one of those functions. The Army Reserve has 100% of the nation's engineer, theater engineering commands, 100% of the theater civil affairs commands. So regional alignment of our units, once we, uh, once we finalize that over the next couple weeks, will be one part of that strategy. The other part will be uh, increased full-time support uh, out into the cores, the ASCCs, and the COCOM. We envision, uh, we'll call them Army Reserve engagement cells at this point. These will be our full-time uh, assets that we invest out into these uh, warfighting headquarters, team of cross-functional planners, medical, civil affairs, engineers, signal, et cetera, uh, that will provide that necessary reach back, back into our various functional headquarters that, uh, that I spoke about uh, earlier. So that's the way that we see the, uh, the plan construct. The second thing we talked about was train. In train, uh, we have a renewed emphasis, an expanded emphasis on the training strategy in, according, uh, in concert with rather our first Army partners. This includes CSTXs and WARXs in our various locations throughout the U.S. and our various training platforms. It includes our 75th Division, our 84th Division, and our first Army infrastructure in uh, reorganizing that to be more efficient. And expanded utilization of our training centers in our training events with all of our components to include the joint force and the interagency. And finally, when we talk about execute, well, we are back to usage. Because usage at some level is important. It's important uh, for a couple reasons, I think. One, obviously, it keeps, uh, uh, when you're actually out doing the missions, it keeps, uh, keeps those soldiers and those formation skills sharp. But also, it's tangible proof of uh, the total force concept. And it's tangible proof of the, the value and the need for uh, the reserve components. So at usage and execution will take the place in terms of combat deployments <laughs> when that's needed. And if not combat deployments and theater security cooperation, military to military engagement, foreign military training, leveraging the regional alignment construct that I spoke about earlier, and then also leveraging uh, the asset that we think that we really bring to the fight that's unique, and that's civilian skill expertise. 
You know, 26% uh, of soldiers in our formations hold more than one MOS. But when you consider their civilian MOS or their civilian job, it's really more like they have three or four. So also our formations are, are really, uh, and the folks in them, are probably uh, got a little more flexibility to uh, stay in those units longer than would be typical in an active uh, component of formation and thus allow us to really linger over the target longer, get to know those uh, regions better, and provide uh, uh, cultural and language expertise. So in conclusion, plan, train, execute. That's the basic uh, formulation for our construct moving forward, together with regional alignment, and how uh, your Federal Reserve is going to contribute to the global security challenge. Thank you. All right, I need everybody to stand up. I told you it's going to be interactive with you anymore. Everybody stand up. If you're, not you guys up front of if you're in the U.S. Army, sit down. All right. If you're a West Point classmate of mine, sit down. <laughs> if you're in the G357, you should have already sat down. All right. If you're from another country, remain standing. If you're in the media, sit down. All right. If you work in the Pentagon, sit down. If you work with Gary Kalnowski, sit down. All right, now this group here, somebody's got the first question. All right, yes, ma'am, go ahead. I think we got to bring mics up to you, too, or somebody's going to. Or if you can move to the mic, that would help. Thank you. This is being webcast to 5 million people right now, so I want you to get nervous. Okay. So uh, my name is Nancy Moulton, Dr. Moulton, and I'm recent re recently retired Army civilian, also served as a Chief Warrant Officer in the Army. And uh, I've spent the last seven years in acquisition in the Pentagon. So now I hear about the regionally focused operations. How are we going to regionalize the requirements process and the acquisition process to match our operational force? That's my question. You want that one, Keith? Sure. <laughs> we are going to talk regional line forces specifically. We're going to talk funding and authorities, maybe a little bit of acquisition. So if we don't get at that fully today, I'll invite you tomorrow about the same time. This one, I don't think regional alignment is that disruptive as one would think. Um, because of this, every type of unit you know, that has an MTO, I, I will, let's call those core capabilities, C-O-R-E, capabilities that everybody in that type unit has to have. If it's an armor brigade combat team, everybody's got to have a house. So then the question is, if you have a, if you get a mission with, within the, the r fortune schedule that the force down lines up, are there additional capabilities you need beyond your intel that you, that you, your soldiers need to have? Well, when I think about um, all of the stuff that we have fielded with RFI, REF, rapid acquisition that we've been doing over the last 10 years, it's, it's, it's really kind of overwhelming, the stuff that we've bought outside the regular program of record. So my uh, first, uh, I, I would offer that the, the demand for that kind of stuff will go down, but let's take Let's take 2nd Brigade, 1st Infantry Division. So they're going to U.S. AFRICOM to support them. So I would envision that when Force Comp gives them the, the word, then U.S. Forces Command also, and those units, in working with the combatant commander, are going to look at, hey, what kind of stuff do they need? And oh, by the way, I said stuff because we always talk about material because that's where the money is, but it's a lot more than that. There is the rest of the Dotnell PF. I think we've recognized this in our adjustment, but are there doctrinal adjustments they have to make? Are there organizational adjustments? And we already know that, because you're not going to put an entire brigade combat team into any nation in Africa. Uh, but you might have squads, platoons, leader groups, etc. So there will be organizational adjustments. There'll be training, okay? The, in the construct, the entire brigade will, th will go through a decisive action rotation. But then after that, when they have the mission, then they'll start focusing on the particular task that, in this case, U.S. AFRICOM would want to have. 
leader development, we've talked about cultural awareness, cultural training, and, and, and language training once you know where you're going to. So there's lots of leader development pieces. Um, personnel, uh, facilities, probably not so much. Um, but then it leaves material. So what kind of additional material solutions? I think we'll see most of it on uh, RFI type stuff, what kind of special kit that soldiers need. There may be, depending on where they go, some great operational energy type solutions to problems when you're in an austere environment advising, um, in, in this example, uh, soldiers from an African nation, perhaps. Um, but I think those are on the margins. Uh, I think those would be incremental. Uh, it would certainly not be something that we automatically want to buy for the whole army. For that matter, we can't afford it. So I think the answer is a deliberate, yet incremental approach that says, okay, everyone's got a set of core capabilities. Examine the mission. Examine the specific rotation. What specific things do we need? Now, having said that, um, you, you threw me a softball on this one, something that, that all of us at this table have talked about. So what is the future of rapid acquisition? Because this is going to, we do need to make some adjustments. There's been great goodness in rapid acquisition in that it has enabled us to get lots more missions done and has saved lives. That's the good side. On the bad side, rapid acquisition has resulted in um, not having our soldiers as trained as we'd like to on that particular at least these material solutions, and not having life cycle sustainment support. We have got to figure out a way as we as we transition the Army in 2020 in regional alignment that we keep the best of rapid acquisition where we can get solutions for soldiers, but we do it in such a way that we do not go down the road of not having life cycle sustainment, not having proper training for our soldiers and units. Sure. Kind of to follow on the, uh, the discussion about regionally aligned forces, um, there's been a lot of discussion, and 2 1 is obviously the first one that's been designated. But as part of the uh, prevent, shape, win process, how do you quantify the goodness or the return on investment that putting resources against these RAF deployments, et cetera? Um, with the amount of details and other deployment pieces and whatever, versus taking those funds and putting them into readiness. You know, the Navy has the same problem with port calls. You know, other than the kids getting off the ship and having a good time, what are the tangible benefits and how do you determine that ROI? That's a great question. Let me, let me start it and maybe pass another panel in here. And again, reemphasize tomorrow at 1400, there'll be a reasonably aligned forces panel that will focus strictly on. Regional Armed Forces. Again, I think, you know, if I was the Chief of Staff, I would tell you that right now we have nine plus brigades regional aligned to CENTCOM in Afghanistan. We just don't take credit for it. Uh, in the Pacific, I talked about 60,000 plus soldiers already in the Pacific that are aligned to PACOM. Same thing with our other combatant commanders. But what we haven't really been able to do, there's been a suppressed demand from our combatant commanders over the last 10 years if you weren't in CENTCOM. And there's many foundational activities we're trying to get done, many requirements that the combatant commanders have that we just have not been able to, as an army, get after. And we think, again, as we have more available forces, we will be able to get after that. The one with 2 1 is really a pilot. We're going to really look hard at what we can do. There's some questions about authorities, there's some questions about funding. And so we have to get at that and learn that. And I think the metrics piece and really the benefit of having these regional armed forces will learn through this pilot as well. We really do think there's a suppressed demand. Northcom, the homeland, you saw that as one of the top missions there. We're looking at how we can provide forces to the Northcom commander. We haven't been able to do that. Uh, but there's a demand signal out there. As part of my job as the op steps, we look at request for forces or RFFs. And right now, there's a pretty uh, pretty big demand from the Northcom commander because we have not been able to provide those forces in the past. And I think you'll see that from all the other combatant commanders as well. So we'll have to work through this. I think the metrics are really what they were able to get done and measure that against the investment that we're going to put toward that, uh, time will tell. But as Keith talked a little bit about the acquisition piece of it, we, we don't really see a big change in equipment, uh, that kind of thing. We're going to train to be decisively, uh, decisive action trained through their 
or CTCs or GRTCs or NTCs. Um, we may gain a little bit of flexibility based on the mission. As they go through the, the uh, R4 Gen model that Burke talked about, they'll be identified in their reset phase who they're going to be regionally aligned to. That combatant commander will give them some specific tasks that may be outside their decisive action tasks. And then when they go into the train and ready phase, they'll work toward those. They'll be validated by the force comp commander. And when they're in their available year, then they'll be aligned to that combatant commander. He can use them for planning, he can use them for exercises. We think it will pay great dividends. But I'm not sure we know enough right now to be able to get out. You know, you, you asked about metrics, and you know, it's not going to ignore, I'm not ignoring the question, but let me look at it in terms of outcomes, and I'll, I'll borrow the Chief's prevent, shape, and link construct. So I think one outcome would be there is a the whole idea of, of prevent, implicit in that is deterrence. And if we as an army are working with another army regionally, there is an inherent deterrence aspect of that. Um, shaping. Should um, there be a requirement and the nation decide that they need to send a joint force to another place? I mean, the, the last thing we want to have to do is fight for it. Wouldn't it be better if you could just turn to your friend with which you have established a partnership and said, hey, can we borrow your airspace or can we walk across this piece of ground? So I think the shaping has an aspect. And then finally, um, you know, when you get to win, I mean, should the terms of the conflict result? Wouldn't it be better if you had some a capable force to fight with you than slugging it out on your own? So I think those are three outcomes that, that regional alignment can really uh, have for us. Sure, if I could also add, I, I, I also kind of challenge us not to try and focus on the conditions that they're going to be operating in for that one, but what fundamental lessons learned, because we're gonna take leaders, you know, somebody, I don't know if it was in this one or, or in another one, but you know, an E-5 who's operating alone and unafraid over in Afghanistan or previously in Iraq, and then he comes back to the United States and he's got all kinds of top cover. Well, now we're gonna be able to put him in that environment again. And so I think as long as we continue to let our leaders learn the fundamental lessons learned of operating in a new environment quickly, because I, I don't think it's gonna be the same people every time. If you give it one PCT, you know, this year maybe a battalion and it'll rotate another battalion. So it's it's a little bit expanding on, you know, train for certainty, educate for uncertainty. It's almost we're educating them for that, that uncertainty of having to pluck them out and stick them in another environment where now they're going to have to quickly learn the, the operating environment, understanding potential threats that may not, you know, be the same. The CTCs will only get us so far. And uh, this is really kind of allowing commanders, I think, an opportunity to focus on an area in all their training and, uh, again, focus on the fundamentals and not, not necessarily the conditions. And if I could uh, address your question directly, who measures it? And it's measured by each of your combatant commanders. And there's a very detailed process having set on that end of it. And each of the combatant commanders measure success in their area of responsibility on a on a, literally on a daily basis. Is their theater security cooperation plan, their strategy working, that we apply the resources in the right place, whether those are Army resources, Navy, whatever, to make sure we're meeting the strategic demand, which is prevent conflict, reduce proliferation, WMD, that kind of thing. So each of the combatant commanders are grading themselves uh, pretty uh, strenuously on this because resources are scarce and they have to apply the resources to get the biggest thing to the buck. So they're measuring literally every day. They feed that information back to the services, specifically, in this case, the Army. And we calibrate the uh, Army Force Generation process to respond to their requirements. So they're kind of establishing the requirements, and we're producing Army forces to meet those requirements. And then for the Army, again, success is probably deploying the right soldiers with the right training at the right time. Great question here. I'm uh, Brigadier General Hans Hannibal from the Dutch Army, being the Director of Operations. Thank you for having us uh, here today. The Dutch have been planning on uh, attacking the United States, but we skipped the plan. We don't have the space for all the uh, prisoners of war. So, but thank you for being here. 
my question is on the comprehensive approach. I think it's great that uh, we learned today that you don't want to fall into the pitfall of preparing for the last war in counterinsurgency. Make sure that we pick up the air and battle and the other stuff too. If I look at Europe, I hope the European countries will do exactly the same. But we are um, very much focusing on the comprehensive approach, meaning that we do not only have to do with defense, but with diplomacy, uh, failing states, governance, and uh, politics as well. My question is, uh, looking to the uh, US force in the next 10 to 15 years, preparing the force, to what extent are you dealing with this comprehensive approach? Back home in Europe, I see that some countries they do a, a two-dimensional war fighting without taking care of politics or whatever. Other countries really go too far, I think. They uh, are taking over what the State Department should do. So my question again is, how far in developing your force, preparing your force, leadership, brigade, uh, core level, are you dealing with the comprehensive approach? I'll start it and turn over to the panel members here. You know, bottom line, I think we've talked about the versatility of our force for 2020. We've talked about agility. we talked about these great soldiers. Uh, and I think our plan right now, as we look forward, is to continue to understand the lessons learned from the last 10, 11 years. Try not to make some of the same mistakes, but over and over, we find out as we talk about that complex environment that we're going to move toward, that we've never gotten right. And we always have to relearn those mistakes over and over as we downsize, as we get rid of equipment as we don't look to the future. So we have the most combat-tested force we've ever had. And our responsibility to the American people is to make sure that we can take, even in a, in a fiscally constrained environment, continue to move forward and make sure that our soldiers, and more importantly, our families, have, again, the right equipment, the right training. And we don't have a glass ball, crystal ball. We can't see 20, 30 years out front. Chief Staff of the Army has instituted several things over the last year to make sure that we're moving forward as we can. He's initiated a strategic studies group with about 30 people that reaches out to universities throughout the land, has brought in several doctors, uh, and folks take a look at not just five years. In fact, they won't look at the short range. They're going to look 15, 20 years out there so that we can get this right. Because we've known in the past we never get it right. We, can't, we won't have the luxury, maybe, to build, up, to build that time up. So as Keith talked about, the key there is really making sure that our junior leaders, our mid-grade non-commissioned officers, our young soldiers, we can grow a young private very quickly. But if we lose that combat-tested leadership, and I always tell people leadership makes a difference, but if we lose that, that's going to take a long time to grow. But I'll turn it over to anybody else from the panel want to take a step. I'm just saying that uh, you hit on a, a very good point about the, the need for coordination. I think between what we do in the U.S. military and what other elements of our government do, sort of a whole government approach. We've, we've been paying lip service to, to a certain extent, uh, over at least the past 10 years or so, but really it handicapped to a certain extent by the lack of capacity in some of the other agencies and departments that we work with, in terms of State Department, in terms of AID. Very, very capable, very dedicated folks, but just small in number. And so we've often had on the military side had to fill those gaps. Um, also, I think in the way we define security, it's it broadened over, over the years that there are a lot of things that we wouldn't have focused on, sort of the post-conflict piece of uh, developing governance and, and the foundations of a, of a stable economic order. All those things that are not within the domain or purview of DOD specifically or directly, but that sometimes we inherit as a, as a function of being on the ground in sufficient numbers to tackle those types of tasks. So I, I think it's, it's going to be an iterative process with, with our partners in state and AID and Treasury and others to, to help them um, marry up their capabilities with ours so that we, we, we don't end up stepping in by default where they should be. Yes, sir, I just add, excuse me, this JRTC rotation that was just talked about earlier, I mean, there is a joint interagency play there where guys on the ground have to they have to deal with it in short duration period. But it is, you know, we are trying to address the, the, the step of CTCs. Yeah, we're doing the same thing with our uh, exercises. And, and General Talley's asked us recently to take a look at, um, at aligning units with uh, uh, 
agency, interagency uh, type of organization. So we have, uh, there's some in the Army Reserve called uh, an IMA, Individual Mobilization Augmentee. And we've really divested ourselves of, uh, over the war in that structure. And he's asked us to kind of reverse that and to look at, um, and, and we're talking maybe uh, a thousand to two thousand sort of spaces to see if we can't find the spaces to create units that would literally be aligned with somebody like the State Department as a way of us learning uh, more about those organizations and then also developing some planning capacity back and back in those. So it's all uh, kind of brand new and you know a little bit of it's up here still and uh, sketchy but I think he's got a, I mean, a commitment to, to do it and to try to figure out how to do it. I'd just add, um, I think the first step, our, our chief does a pretty good job at um, it reminding us that rather than have a bunch of army guys and gals sit in a room and look at ourselves in the mirror, the reason we exist is because of the unique capabilities we provide the joint force commander. So that, that that's the start point. Um, the second we mentioned a little bit, um, we get after it with training, leader development, and education. Part of that education is professional development assignments of our officers into the interagency uh, force. And that's, that is really, really important. We haven't done that as well as we've liked, and so we want to deliberately expand to that. And the other aspect, I think, is outreach with the interagency. Um, you know, keep it in mind that the, we, we realize that other departments are not resourced in the same way that we are and probably are not going to be, I mean, especially now. But um, perhaps that makes the outreach all that much more important. So um, their participation in our training, we, we always invite them. They're uh, attending the Army War College or uh, the Industrial College of the Armed Forces, the various strategic level education forums. I, I know we, um, the department offers slots there. Um, in our own campaign of learning, we, we don't conduct these experiments and war games without trying to include them to make sure we broaden our approach. So that's what we're trying to do to, to be comprehensive, sometimes more successful than others. We talked about JRTC and the conditions are going under right now. I think as you may know, at, uh, in Europe, our JMRTC, 19 different countries, also a huge agency play going on. And I think what Mr. Harvey talked about is, is really, uh, we can't make light of it. That is, other agencies we know are just not manned, equipped, and, and trained and have the budget that the, the DOD has been have over the last several years. So just case in point, some of the guys in the room will like it. In RC East, uh, a couple years ago, 2010, we looked at probably 250 was the requirement of civilians that we needed in our cities to get out and get to all the districts to work the governance piece and development piece. And when we surged 30,000 plus uh, forces into Afghanistan to get to that 250, the highest I ever got in our cities was about 125 civilians. And it wasn't a lack of, uh, they didn't want to do it, it was just hard to grow that. But he, I said that we have the most battle tested combat soldiers that we've ever had. I think you'll see now in, in the State Department, foreign area officers, you have some of the best that we've ever seen, we've interacted with, based on the experience that they've had, both in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I think down the road, they understand that value. Uh, that'll work very hard. Yesterday, I was at a function. I had uh, an ambassador library in my house, and she's getting ready to go to Burundi. She spent many, many years in both Iraq and Afghanistan. At her ceremony Friday, she talked about her experience with the Army and what that meant to her. She became an ambassador there. So I, I think we've made some inroads out there. We're going to continue to get better. Continue working for her. Back and back. So, good afternoon. I'm Colonel Toff of BTD, British Liaison Officer to Tradoc. Um, and I'd like to ask a question about multinationality. Um, uh, certainly, you, sir, you mentioned in the beginning the importance of multinationality. And you, re you rarely hear a uh, a, a talk or a, or a presentation without Jim, Jim being mentioned. Um, but I'd like to sort of dig a little bit deeper, if I may, and ask whether the panelists have a view on how you can actually realise the sort of multinational dimension of operations in the future, particularly so it's against the context of um, the end of operations when we're forced together in theatre and also the increasing uh, financial pressure on all our armies, not least. Um, some of your more junior partners. Um, and so, 
uh, sort of in, in asking that, I, I wonder if I can sort of give you a couple of hooks that you may or may not pick up on. First of all, do you see that you, there's, a, there's a situation where you may compromise on capability in order to ensure that the multinational partners can remain involved? That's sort of one example. I also wonder whether you've got a comment on the importance of existing or also sort of developing um, alliances. Um, and I wonder whether you've got any other, other ideas of, sort of novel ways of incorporating your multinational partners in, in operations in the future. Yeah, great question. I'll, I'll take a stand and I'll turn over some of the folks over here. And I have talked to Nick Carter and what you're looking at with your army down the road, and I think there's some similarities that he's learned that he's taking take into your army based on Iraq and Afghanistan as well. But I can talk to my experience of going to Afghanistan about how we incorporated different countries, different armies into our battle space, how we trained within Party Going, the two biggest site 18. I think one time went down to about 11 countries in RCDs, the biggest being uh, France and then Poland. Uh, but we incorporated them into the training before we deployed, then we got in the country, uh, that continued to pay dividends based on the relationships we had set the pre deployment training that we had together. But I think the important part is we, we fully understand that, as you talked about, the budgets of all different countries are different. And I, I don't think we down down to the capability that you talked about. I think a better way of looking at it is that we have to understand what capabilities other countries bring to the fight and then maximize that use. And as long as you understand what they can and can't do, as you know, all countries, even the U.S., have different caveats. Some can do this at night, some can't do it at night. Some have to go out in a number of vehicles, some can do this. Some can't fly different places. But as a commander, you deal in terms of risk. You have to understand the capabilities of all your forces that maximize their use. Even if you have a very small contingent of 100 people from country X, that's 100 that you wouldn't have there providing that great capability they bring. But you got to understand what they can and can't do and utilize that to the best your ability. Anybody else? I would just say we, we've seen um, a, a really interesting and um, expansive interest in reserve component uh, in some of our um, uh, allied uh, partners in, uh, in foreign countries in terms of being able to, to stand those up or expand their reserve components. Interest in coming to talk to us about how to do that and um, you know part of, of course what's driving that is just the fiscal reality in, in uh, everybody's country. Uh, also, to answer your question specifically, again, the uh, probably three things will help, and it's uh, really looking pre-9/11 um, in terms of schools, exercises, and exchanges. And those three things, those three areas, were the ways we used the means, if you will, we used to uh, pull together our multinational partners to ensure, as we look to the future, as we develop doctrine for the future as we train for potential contingencies, it was through schools, exchanges, and exercises that, were, that we were able to sustain that, uh, you know, uh, before 9-11. So as we kind of move back now into uh, an era where perhaps we're not going to see events like Afghanistan and Iraq bearing so heavily on us, we will probably see a little bit of a return to that as the means to pull allies together. The other piece that we have to continue to upkeep, I think, is two things. One is the staff talks we do with, with many of our coalition brothers. And then the exchanges, as Burke talked a little bit, not only the school, but working on our staffs. So uh, I had officers from other countries who were working on my staff uh, in Afghanistan in 2003. I had a British officer that was my plans officer at Brigade Lake. And so we got to continue to work that piece of the Tough for you asked about uh, the future, and, and uh, you know, in this sense, you threw me a softball because you know I'm interested in it. I'm, I'm very concerned about you know interoperability with our partners is critical. Our number one modernization priority in our army has been the network, which will enable some you know some real aspirations we have for mission command, um, and. At the same time, uh, you know, with the network, we, 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 we fight about it in Iraq and Afghanistan, but among ourselves, we fight about how, how in the world we plug in the rest of our partners in our own network. Um, so, we had not figured it out yet, but, but we better figure it out as we go to the future. So our network, so that we can be interoperability with our partners uh, in mission command, and that's a huge challenge. 
you know, as, as we know, around here we're very, very bureaucratic and uh, tough to get things done sometimes. It can be very frustrating. But when you get on the ground, the sharing of information between coalition, I think, uh, for those that have been in Iraq and Afghanistan, has just come twofold. It's, it's increased over the years. We know that we, we can't work that alone in isolation. We have to be able to share information, be able to work together in the operational environment there. So I think that's also increased. Other questions? If I could uh, just shift gears a little bit back uh, into the joint arena. Uh, I'm retired Air Force, and uh, you know, when you look at uh, everything that's going on now, the budgets are shrinking, forces are shrinking, the mission set's the same, kind of the same old thing for all of us as, uh, as we've gone through our careers. But really, the question is. Uh, given that the mission set is going to remain the same, the globe is going to continue to be as big as it is, how are we going to do all the stuff that we need to do among the joint forces with the resources that are out there? And uh, how, are the, uh, how are the services cooperating together to make sure that we can meet all the demands of the nation to meet the, uh, the uh, future uh, military strategy? Uh, great question. Uh, I'll start it off again and ask for some help. You know, as, as a G357, one of my principal duties is the op steps for the Army. So every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I go to the tank. And every Monday and Friday, I go to the, the tank as a plus one for the chief, where he meets with all the other service chiefs. And I would say, having been in that environment years ago on the joint staff, and now as the G3, the cooperation, the understanding, the relationships, because we fought for the last 10 years together, uh, is really pretty neat. And so you can sit around a table and talk about very hard, decisions, whether it's an Army problem, an Air Force problem, Marine, Coast Guard, Navy, it doesn't matter. Uh, but the dialogue around that table uh, is different than it was in years past. And I think everybody understands we're all in this boat together. We all have to be physically constrained on what we're going to buy or not buy. We're trying to move things in a joint environment so that we can help each other out. And I think that cooperation relationship is the best I've seen. So I think that's going to help down the road. But there's other things we can do. The air sea battle, something that the Air Force and Navy started. The Army now has members in the Air Sea Battle Office. Uh, there's other initiatives out there that the Chief is looking at with other services as he looks at not only uh, staff talks with other countries, but staff talks with other services. We've had a few of those, but they take some very hard uh, problem sets out there, the challenges between the services. They come together with all of the principal staff and meet for a full day and talk through those. And then over the course of a year, all those have milestones that we get at and periodically come back and talk about programs that we work together, whether it's the JLTV with the Marine Corps, whether it's some sort of vertical lift with the Air Force, whether it's direct support with the Air Force, other things out there. We know that we can't do this, as I said earlier, by ourselves. We have to work together. And then shame on us if we can't do that. So we fight uh, very well together. People's lives are at stake. You're sitting next to somebody and, and you're sharing the hardship. It's not hard. You come back into the Pentagon, you tend to go back into those stovepipes, and we got to eliminate those and work together. I think for the most part, uh, it, it's very tough, um, but I think uh, the leadership that we have in all the services are committed to making sure that we force ourselves to do that. At least that's what I'm saying. I think we're really going to have to be disciplined in our approach to, to how we do um, uh, building our capacity and outreach to partners in, in particular regions, um, there, there can sink in to COCOM mentalities that need to plant a flag in, in every country in the AOR. But I think we're going to have to look very carefully at which partners can produce, because back to the question metrics, which one really are, are critical to our conception of our own security and security in the region, and make sure that we're making those investments. You know, um, as we transition certainly out of Iraq and, and Afghanistan, uh, smaller distributed teams are going to be the way we do these types of outreach and engagement activities, I think, in, in the future. Um, that will conserve on the force as it's deployed. It will also create uh, new challenges in terms of logistics and support we provide for those teams that go out. I think soft GPF integration is going to be a big piece of that and so that we maximize our ability to, to find the right, select the right force to train counterparts on the, on the right task. And I think also we're going to need to look at how we uh, coordinate with our, our partners. Uh, 
those in Europe who have uh, a particular expertise or presence in a region and can basically collaborate with us in doing the outreach we think is in our mutual security interest. So we'll have to coordinate our activities uh, more closely in the future. Other questions? Sir? It's no fair if you wrote that down there, sir, so I'm not sure we're going to ask that question. My name is Gerald Van Ness, and I'm with IHASP. Uh, and I'm wondering about direct energy systems for ground combat vehicles for both uh, pre detonation of IEDs, also lasers, and does the military have money to fund counter ID uh, equipment? So the question is. So again, does the Army have money to fund counter ID equipment? Equipment to deal with uh, pre-detonation of IEDs and uh, interrogation of IEDs. I'll start. Uh, and I think many of those, a couple guys from the front row and others out here will tell you that uh, we've been uh, shooting left of the curve here, left of the boom many times uh, because we haven't been able to get out in front. But I would tell you over the last several years of cooperation between JIDO and all of the services to get at uh, counter ID equipment, uh, both the material and the training aspects of it has been huge. We know that the number one killer on the battlefield has been the IEDs, and we continue to adapt. Um, but when you get right down to it, the best locator, finder of an ID is, is a soldier. I talked about that up front. Uh, we're helped by the technology that it brings. Uh, I think the equipment for the future, and Keith talked a little bit about RAF and the rapid equipping fielding that we've been able to have, and so we've been able to move quickly toward uh, getting the material we need. Uh, Dr. Carter, the DevSec Def now, is doing very instrumental in making sure that we have always kept a focus on, on counter ID, and uh, he will personally go down to the units as they get ready to deploy and take a look at their pre deployment training to make sure that. We're doing everything we can in the Army to, to look at that. Uh, we've taken equipment that we shipped forward quickly to get it in place, and that was our priority, was to get it in country. And now, as we've gotten most of that there, we've backed off a little bit. Maybe Burke could add to this, but we've outfitted equipment back here so we can train with it, so the first time you see it is not in country. So I think we'll continue to understand that uh, IEDs will have a role, will have a role in the future, and we'll have to continue to to make sure we stay tuned in to take a look at technology and advancements in technology to outfit our soldiers with the right sector. I would say for us, uh, in terms of the operational force, it's making sure we have sufficient uh, counter IED equipment to train on its own station, to make sure we have the sufficient capacity to execute uh, CTC rotations, NTC, JRTC, those kind of things. And then for our deploying units, uh, moving into a theater where they're going to face this threat, that they're given the latest equipment that uh, the Army can provide regarding uh, some of the capabilities you address. So for us, it's three levels. Home station training, the CTC rotations, and then making sure the uh, deploying units have the, the latest and very best equipment that we can provide them. Some of that equipment is, as you know, uh, left in theater for units to fall in on versus deploying with it. And we try with GIO's assistance to make sure that equipment is as modernized as we can make it. You know, the, what i got to add, though, is and we're very grateful for the great work that GIO and, and everybody else in technology and industry has provided. But the enemy gets a vote, right? So IEDs continue to adjust, and as soon as we fig think we got it figured out, they change it. We have to come back to something else. So if we ever become complacent, and we know we can't, then we're in trouble. So we'll continue with the radar. So I don't want to get into specific programs that we're, that we're working on. Other questions? Sir? Generals, my name is John Albert Canon. First, thank you all for a very interesting presentation. And secondly, excuse me for my poor mastering of the uh, Shakespeare language. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a US Army West Point or Pentagon earmarked. I'm just a French retired general working now for the National Defense Industry Association called GCAT. Uh, US Army modernization is focused on the ready combat team modernization program. 
Uh, in France, we have a French army modernization program called Scorpion, focused on the reinforced combined battle group. I invite you, sirs, to have a short visit on the French pavilion, booth 72-29, where the French army can show you with the modernization Scorpion program. My question is, uh, Concerning the integration uh, of the platforms, soldiers, future soldiers, unmanned ground vehicles, well, all which is around the collaborative direct engagement combat. Uh, with the FCS and uh, lead system integrator lesson learned, and now with the modernization brigade combat team program lesson learned, would you uh, recommend? Or would it be necessary or not to have an industrial mirror structures of the Arctic of Traddock, so-called uh, system integrator architect, in order to manage the rules of integration and interoperability inside the industry for both equipment and systems? All right, keep me as bad, even I may not want to. But first off, I want to tell you is I had the great privilege to serve with Task Force Lafayette, as did Dan Allen here in our cities, and we had the uh, great commanders, they own a Capisa, and have done very well, continue to do very well in Afghanistan. So thank you for their service. But Keith, you want to try that? Yeah, sir. That's not a true false question either. First of all, I'm not sure I understood all of your questions, so I'm in danger of answering something you didn't ask me. Um, so our approach to um, to integrating our network in our platforms has been the, um, we, we had this revelation or uh, actually more of a blinding flash of the obvious. If you don't, you, you cannot evaluate the network in a simulation. You have to actually do it in the field over the proper distances and the proper ground. And that started the uh, what has now become the network integration evaluation. So that as new uh, capabilities are developed that are appropriate for a brigade to be evaluated in a brigade operational context, that the that that system or that capability gets evaluated in that context at Fort Bliss, and it's something we do uh, twice a year. Uh, it has been focused on the network, although we do other capabilities also, doctrinal, organizational, and training capabilities, but because the network is our, our priority, um, that is our integration priority right now, and that's our, our means for doing so. I, I want to stop in case I completely did not answer your question. It's a part of the answer. The question is, if you wait that you arrive at the experimentation in the field to test the interoperability of the integration of capabilities, uh, you, you, you risk a, a miss of interoperability. So the question is, is it necessary or not that in the industry you have a sort of sheriff making the law and telling to the other industry, if you want to integrate to the global program, you must be confident and compliant with that, that and that rules. Answer is yes, and um, our communications electronics command um, has become our our, our single um, gatekeeper to ensure that anything that we we actually evaluate that it has to go through and and prove that it is technologically feasible and interoperable interoperability feasible. And before, before we got that capability, um, we we lost some valuable time. We have time for one more question. No, you're not going to ask me the question. Oh, go ahead. We'll take your time. Well, okay, so a little different question. We talked a little bit today about maintaining our junior leaders in our army and how we're going to do that. This morning, the secretary talked a little bit about things that keep him up at night, challenges, so to speak. And so I want to ask all of you on the panel, or any one of you on the panel, if you would for me, is we realize that we, 
We have to maintain our junior leaders in our army. So as we move forward, um, what do you think, what keeps you up nights, so to speak, on how to maintain those junior leaders in our army as we move forward? And then a follow-up question would be, since many of us in the private sector are <clears throat> involved with helping in the quality of life issues, housing, things of those natures, how can we help you better get to where you want to keep those junior leaders in the Army? I'll start and just go down very quickly. Uh, first off, thanks for the question, Steve. You know, I think all of us stay awake at night making sure or wondering if we've made the right decisions, uh, if we've done everything we can do to, to set the conditions for non-commissioned officers for those, for those junior leaders. I think um, you know, what we can do now, based on what we've learned over the last 10 years, is you know, I think uh, Keith or maybe Paul talked about it. You know, we put people in situations of, of life and death uh, over in theater, and then they come back over here, and we we uh, very bureaucratic. You know, go to a range, and you can't you can't fire because your fire extinguisher's out of, out of date or something like that. When they've been making life and death situations, so what we can't do is do stupid things like that. We've got to make sure that we continue to challenge our young junior leaders because that's what they thrive on. That's what they join the Army for. And uh, leadership makes a difference to do that. So we have to be able to continue to, to challenge them uh, with the right type of training to keep them focused. And I think uh, we have the right leadership in place at all levels to, to do that. So that's kind of a, there's a lot of things that keep me up at night, but that would be one. And what you could do and what the rest of the American people could do, I think, for us we're very appreciative of everything that has already gone on. And when people will say, hey, thanks for your service, that, that's really good. But I, I tell you, the, the Secretary hit on it today, and he didn't get little goosebumps on it when he talked about the families and really understanding what they've had to go through. Um, we, we don't do enough. So just saying thanks for your service, that's pretty good, but that's not enough. We can do more. We can see somebody at a restaurant and buy their meal. We can see them have troubles with their kids and help them there. There's so many things that we just take for granted and that we shouldn't take for granted if we really understood the, uh, what these great families go through. So uh, thank you for all that you do and thanks everybody else from the American people. But there, there's, we, what we can't do is stop. So as we come out of Iraq and Afghanistan and the wounded warriors we have, the families, you know, we have a debt that's going to be very, very hard if ever to be able to repay. And we can't stop doing that. Uh, just because we're out of Iraq and Afghanistan. We, we owe that to them for the rest of their lives. So that's going to be our challenge as a nation. Yes, sir, I think I'd just like to echo that. I think the things that uh, kept us all in as junior leaders uh, still apply today. Tough, realistic training, uh, meaningful missions, somebody who cares about their, their development, their advancement, their families. All of those things um, are what kept us in, and that's, I think, what will keep uh, junior leaders in as we look at the future. I would say in terms of uh, what we should do uh, collectively as a nation is, as you know, we assess, um, I forget the actual number, but the, uh, the amount of people that are eligible to come into the Army, that percentage now is surprisingly small. I think only about one out of every four American males, age 18 to 24, are even eligible to come in. So, and they're being recruited by colleges, universities, every other service goes down. So it's a very select group that comes in. But when they leave the Army, the unemployment rate for them, for our young veterans, is about 40%. So that's, I think, a place we can uh, tangibly reach out as a society, and, uh, as America, and take care of them. And I would just offer that to you as an option. Thanks. Yeah, we're going to have a symposium on training leaders, developing leaders. I think it's way to good. So take a look at that. I want to thank uh, everybody here in the panel. I think you've done a great job. <laughs> I have a message especially to our friend from the Secretary of Defense Office down at the end here. Every country has an army. Not every country has a navy. And if they do have a navy, it's rarely a blue water navy. And not every country has an air force to compare anywhere near the Air Force we have, and if they do have, it's not nearly like that at all. But every country has an army, and this is what the U.S. Army is talking about, going out and touching and maintaining our relationship. 
At the end of the Vietnam War, this is 1975, when the North Vietnamese made a major attack into the South and defeated the South Vietnamese Army down there. With the help of the Congress, the U.S. Army dissolved U.S. Army Pacific Command in a block and reduced that to a two-star general and it was called Western Command. And immediately, the commander of Pacific Command and that general decided that we had to have a relationship with the other armies in the Pacific area. And so they started two programs. One was a very low-level program of soldiers going out and visiting. And there was a visit by some of the higher people. But also, they started a program at a higher level called Pacific Army Management Symposium, which is still going on, right? And uh, this is where they brought in the leaders of a variety of different armies. And eventually, the Indian Army and many others that we would not consider necessarily Pacific Armies were, in fact, brought into that. Anybody who was in a country that belonged to Pacific Command. And that changed an awful lot. One of the things that the 25th Division did was they sent their band out to the Western Pacific to play at various different countries because the U.S. Army's thought process and the relationship we had had through the Vietnam War meant many of them politically could not accept the U.S. Army from out of business. But they sure liked that band. And once the band was there, once the leaders had gone to Hawaii and participated in the PAMs, more and more began to happen in the row in between. Now, uh, then we've got into the war here, and so that has probably turned things around the other way in the other direction. But there are many things in the past that are somewhat the same, but also very much different than what we have right now. And this is a tremendous job I think we've had in the past year. I want to thank you all very much for being a part of that. The U.S. Army is going to participate with many other armies in the Western Pacific. It has. And it will. Thanks very much, Pat.